Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Senate Education Wednesday, March 29, 3.15. Uh, we just returned from the floor, and we have one agenda item today. It will take us about 45 minutes or so. Uh, PCB testing in schools. And we have Dr. Levine with us and Commissioner Belling uh, from the Department of Environmental Conservation. Just to review with us, Dr. Levine, if you would, so PCBs in general, testing protocols, kind of bring us back to where this committee has had a little bit of this conversation uh, this year, and I know committee members are have questions, so sort of an information gathering afternoon. Super. Perfect. Well done. So what I will do in a very brief time is talk a little bit about health because have to yeah. um, talk a little bit about the Vermont framework, if you will, for testing and why it's based on air and why we believe uh, we should not cost it. Okay. Does that sound reasonable? reasonable? Thank you. There we go. So this is just an overview of health. I'll go into these in uh, minimal detail. Uh, but the Overlying uh, concept is PCBs are bad. Um, they cause serious health problems, and we shouldn't doubt that years after we actually created the legislation to do the testing. Um, we have studies in animals that are very clear. We have reports from humans that show outcomes uh, that are seen in animals happen in humans as well. And though they don't call these forever chemicals like the PFOA compounds, they are in your body a very long time, a very long half-life, if you will. Um, so if you're a young person and you get exposed, um, it can translate into um, developing baby exposure years down the road. Your, your infant. Your exactly. Yes. Okay. And just so everyone knows, this is in our pile. In our pile. And some of these health effects can be interrelated, as I'll show you. So just you saw the cancer. Melanoma is the one that has been most conclusively uh, recognized as a causal relationship. Uh, breast and liver and lymphoma of the Hodgkin's type are also a concern. When you think you hear in the media some controversy about are these bad or not, it's because various organizations label them differently. So the EPA calls it as a probable human carcinogen, which is a pretty high level for them. The IARC uh, just comes out and says it is carcinogenic. The National Toxicology Program says that it's reasonable to conclude that these are carcinogens in humans. And the weakest uh, one is NIOSH, which says potential occupational carcinogens. But we also really dwell on the non-cancer effects of these uh, substances. And that's in the immune, reproductive, endocrine, and neurologic systems. So the immune systems, obviously, how do we fight foreign invaders into our body? Um, and uh, there's a bunch of things on the slide. I'm not going to go into detail except to say that these do act as suppressants of your immune system. And if you remember from COVID, anytime you're somewhat suppressed in your immune system, you're at risk. And so um, we think this is possibly linked to why cancer is also impacted of the impact on the immune system. Looking at the reproductive system, the take-home messages are that there have been studies showing decrease in birth weight and uh, increase in the amount of prematurity. The next two are more developmental, meaning they can be in the fetus or in the infant. So we'll start with the central nervous system. Uh, like other things we've talked about in this committee that uh, you're concerned about with school, like impact on short-term memory, impact on attention, impact on learning, visual recognition, uh, the PCBs have been uh, associated with problems in those arenas. Um, and again, 
and interrelation from other effects. And then, I don't want to get too heavy into thyroid hormone and endocrinology, but suffice it to say that, especially with regards to um, normal development in the fetus and in the uh, infant, um, thyroid hormone can be involved. And if this impacts the level of thyroid hormone, it can adversely affect those things. Uh, because the thyroid hormone is our sort of metabolic hormone in the development growth and development. So that's the health part, just to get us on the same foundation. Does anyone have any questions about the health part, concerns, disagreements? I think it would just pause here right now and see. Senator, if you have a question. That's weird. I'm sorry, Senator Williams. <laughs> well, it's my name. <laughs> okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, next, I want to impress upon you how they impact us. PCBs are throughout our environment, even though they have been banned since 1979, and they do last a long time. We get them often through our diet, fatty foods, so fatty fish, meats, and unfortunately in Vermont, dairy products. Um, normally, that creates a background level for everyone so that we have to be careful in looking at levels of exposure and levels of screening to make sure we account for the fact that the background level is not zero uh, throughout the country. Um, but here I want to get you focused on air, because the biggest source of exposure for students and staff in buildings that have older construction, which is the majority of our school system, unfortunately, um, meaning before 1980, um, it's through the air, uh, leaching from materials that were used in construction, whether they're caulking materials, um, whether they're paints, whether they're um, in the fluorescent ballasts, which hopefully they're not so much in our schools because there was a whole project years back to deal with that. Um, so air is really the thing that is where the biggest exposure is. And like anything else, it's a matter of how often, how much, how long to determine an individual's risk from Sir, if I could, just out of curiosity, so can you comment, though, on PCB presence in water and soil? Is it is it an item of concern? Yes, or? it is. That's probably where the fish are getting it. However, uh, that's not the way humans are getting to the level where these health effects would be seen. It's usually through the air. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes, Anything from the waste stream, like the sewage uh, treatment facilities? In terms of PCBs getting into the into the water. Getting it into the water. Mm -hmm. My colleague here from DDC might help you. I'm sure there is some. It, it's that's more of a PFAS mm -hmm. concern these okay. days. We have it. I mean, PCBs are pretty ubiquitous in right. the environment, so I wouldn't be surprised. I can find out what they're showing up in. That type of waste stream, but they're not unusual. You find them in soils throughout the state. So, thank you, Senator. Uh, just probably another question for you. Um, so, PCBs are they at all naturally occurring, or are they ubiquitous in soil and water just because we've manufactured them so much and they just been dispersed? So, I, I should state for the record, uh, John Ewing. Environmental Conservation Commissioner. They, they're are, they're are, they're manufactured. Yeah. I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure. So this what I'm going to present to you now doesn't make it into the media very often. Um, usually, it's they sort of say, "Why is Vermont so unique? Why are we different than EPA?" All of that kind of stuff. But as you can see in the title to the slide. Vermont levels are based on EPA levels and the framework that EPA set out. The difference is it's using current research. The EPA findings were set in 1994. Doesn't mean they haven't looked at them since, it's just they haven't revised uh, their framework since. Um, and that's an important point. Um, the team at my uh, environmental Health Division and Health Departments that help work on these, along with colleagues across state government, also work with EPA in the development of these and with consultants uh, and very knowledgeable experts around the country 
for which there are not very many, I might add, because this is a fairly specialized field in toxicology. So we've got a screening level of 15. Uh, that's just sort of that raises our eyebrow level. It's really the action levels that um, are where we need to focus. And we have two sets of levels. We have school action levels and immediate action levels. The school action levels, as you might imagine, are higher than the screening level, but lower than the immediate action level. The immediate action level is get out of that room. You can't use that room because it's a toxic environment. Um, I would say that, yes, our action levels, as the slide illustrates, are lower than that of EPA. Um, that shouldn't be a cause for concern or alarm. Um, and I'll bring you back to the PFAS set of compounds once again. In 2016, when Bennington learned that they had the misfortune of this problem, um, the EPA level was 400 parts per trillion. That was all that existed. But we took a different approach and said, well, that isn't going to be very health protective. So to be health protective, we went down to a level of 20. Within a few months of us going to 20, EPA went from 400 to 70. And within a few months of that, I don't know how many states, but many other states adopted levels that were equal to Vermont or actually stricter than Vermont. Uh, so we're often pioneers, and I'd like you to look at us as looking at science, being driven by the science, and not sort of being cowboys just saying, here's what we're doing, because uh, it's a very informed process. EPA regulates a number of chemicals under a program called TOSCA, which is the Toxic Substances Control Act. And the partner chemicals are, it's not good company to be in. It's formaldehyde, it's lead, it's asbestos, it's mercury, and it's the PFAS set of compounds. Um, now, for many of these, there are easier ways to avoid exposure. We've talked about don't drink the water, use bottled water, whatever. It's hard to tell children, don't breathe while you're in class. Uh, so this made us have to be even more serious about the task at hand. Um, we used some of that information that I showed you about developmental neurotoxicity uh, that I just referred to, to uh, really use the current science in developing our levels. And that is why they are level than the ECAs. Uh, most of the time, we set a level of a cancer risk of one in a million. That's kind of a standard in the field. And um, that was where we came from when we were starting to develop our action levels. Our colleagues in DEC helped us determine that even a level of 22.5 might be something that you might mix up with a background level because of the trashing of the environment and uh, the contributions of food and what have you. And if you regulate down to that level, you're going to be chasing your tail a lot because you're never going to find a source of PCBs in the environment because it may not be the environment. It may be the background level that's actually been the problem. Um, so uh, that's why our action levels are a little bit higher than the level you saw on the slide. The immediate action level is almost by definition three times the lower action level. So that's where that comes from. <laughs> Keep in mind, we're not just using cancer, we're using the non-cancer impacts for developing these. Uh, this is a pretty key slide, um, so yeah. thank you for offering this. Uh, just curious, so the 1994 levels established in your professional opinion, do those need to be revisited or by the EPA? By the EPA, yes, sir. Uh, for sure. Okay. Uh, and, and it's not that they're asleep at the wheel. They have a team of scientists, in fact, that we use as consultants, who are much up to date. It's just the process of changing the regulatory structures and the policies lags behind that. Okay. Given, given the, the cost of, potential cost of school renovations and potentially following on to workplace renovations and home renovations, Yep. Do, you, do you feel that the EPA is motivated uh, enough to... Um... I can tell you they're watching Vermont very closely because they were very involved 
with the Burlington High School decision and uh, with the work site. They were consulting on the site because of all the findings there. And um, so they're very focused on, on this. At the same time, some of their uh, setting of levels involved residential and how much time you're asleep in the home. Uh, ours are actually much more focused on school and how much time a staff member or a student is present uh, in a given room or in a given building, um, which is where that is going now. Okay, good. Um, and just curious, these these uh, thresholds uh, yes. are these adult thresholds or, they, or is they it, are, does it? No, they are age dependent. So thirty would be for a preschool, a uh, hundred would be for a high school or adult. Uh, the reason for that has to do with. Uh, the contribution is of the nutritional factors to the underlying uh, baseline in those groups and the amount of weight each has. So a very, very young person, uh, the impact per gram of body weight is going to be different than for them. Thanks. And as you'll see, when we make decisions about who can be in a room, we use the age-specific So, this slide doesn't tell you anything you don't know. Um, you know the state paying for uh, testing, what was Act 74, I believe, was the act that, uh, that the legislature came up with. Uh, and in that, we test about a third of the rooms in the school. Because of that, you need to develop grouping strategies. Because many rooms in the school have the same risk. Same building materials, same essential, you know, a class, one classroom looks like another in many cases, but that may look very different than the auditorium or the gym or the kitchen. Uh, so you need to be able to group like with like because that's part of the strategy for what are you going to do if a room is found that exceeds the thresholds uh, and can you still put students in other rooms. So we'll show that in the next couple slides. Um, which I think will illustrate for you what happens. Keep in mind, because questions always come up, this is the strategy developed and the law developed long after the Burlington High School issue. And it's hard to make comparisons between what happened there and what happens um, in current testing because there was no grouping strategy, there was no protocol for testing, there wasn't even a, uh, a percentage of rooms tested. Uh, it was not, not done in that manner because it was done with the interest of getting to a new construction and just doing the testing that was required to move them to new construction or renovation. Renovation is probably more appropriate word. Yeah. So this picture, just imagine, and, and, and it's not imaginary made up, it's consultants developed this. Um, all the green rooms are the same in terms are of pop, the green rooms are the same. same. They're all similar building materials, similar, you know, sort of like this committee room looking like the one next door to it. Um, and there are no extraneous factors that would make one a higher risk one than another. Same for the yellow, the blue, the red. So obviously these triangles that are in there in yellow, those are the rooms that are actually tested. And it's not every green room. Uh, so that if green rooms all end up looking pretty similar on the testing, it means that the rooms that were tested are probably going to have looked that way too. Whereas obviously there's only two red rooms um, they're both tested, and you can't extrapolate beyond them for anything. So that's how we sort of set that up. Then you do the testing, you get results back. Obviously, any result over that immediate action level means that room can't be used, period. But since that doesn't happen the majority of the time, if there are exceedances, they're in the school action level, the 30 to 100 range. You, we have been able to create a protocol with our colleagues that allow several options. The options basically either provide restricted or unrestricted use of the rooms, and they do it for specific numbers of hours per week. 
that allows, the goal is, and this is important, especially coming off the pandemic, it allows students and faculty to continue to be housed in the school building, knowing that the whole building is not at risk, but there are portions of the building that are. And so the goal is keep students in in-person learning, don't close schools, and arrive at an accommodation that allows the school and the consultants to figure out the sources, start with the mitigation strategies, and move on from there. So I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but basically the lowest risk option restricts the use of the rooms to certain numbers of hours, depending on what age student is in the room and what number of hours they're there. But they have a year to actually um, fix things without any undue excess exposure to them. Whereas if you go to the higher risk on the right side of the slide, basically the rooms can be used in an unrestricted way, but there's a very limited time frame, usually like six weeks, and you need to basically have mitigation underway and do retesting and all of that in a very rapid fashion. So we try to meet the school where they are um, and where and at what level that community is willing to accept risk. Uh, while mitigation will be ongoing. So while we're on that slide, yeah, just so yeah. uh, we all know, so if a, a test would come back in a certain school, it, it doesn't mean the school closes tomorrow. It hasn't yet today. Okay, and those decisions are being left to whom? So one room is tested yeah. and it's at a uh, low risk. The school decide, the school then, in conjunction with its board, super Tenant would make a decision, I'm assuming, to say, this is low risk, we're going to continue to operate, exactly. but this classroom, for obvious reasons, will not be used at this point. Right. Okay. Because there's mitigation, you know, I don't know if you're going to get into mitigation versus remediation, but there's mitigation strategies that can be immediately implemented that might really be game changers, and then there's ultimate remediation strategies that may come along at a time when the school's not in session, like in the summertime or what have you, that can be implemented. Uh, the school sees this report, um, which basically tells them what the result was in every room and what rooms were tested, what rooms weren't tested, and then based on those results, here are their options. So you can see that for room 203, there's basically no use of that room because the level was so high uh, in option one. However, it wasn't so high that it, it caused an immediate action level uh, threshold so that some of the other options can be still used, but there's a six week timeline on them and there's strategies that have to be implemented concurrently. Senator Reed. So that, this report is does this public information once it oh, comes yeah. out? Okay. There's a letter that goes okay. to the school and the community, but then uh, beyond that, um, there are meetings that are actually held with members of DEC, members of the health department, um, and the school. Um, I'm not sure we've had them publicly yet because we've offered them, but they haven't necessarily been uh, taken advantage of. But there's a clear set of guidelines. Just wanted to bring back in the last two slides the perspective that, um, number one, um, everybody knows these are a problem, but not everyone's paying as much attention as we are. Um, and um, there are countries like Sweden where all public buildings have to remove PCBs. Um, that's sort of on that extreme. On the other extreme are some of the headlines that are in the slide showing that problems are being found but they're not necessarily being addressed um, and putting communities at risk, if you will. Um, but in that role of being the only state addressing it and being the pioneers, uh, you might imagine we come under a bit of fire now and then. Uh, and you might imagine people are like, well, you know, looking very closely at the way we do things, and that's why I've taken some pains to show you that. Um, but it's not been done before, so 
we hope we're getting it right. Perhaps getting it right means even doing more than we're doing. Um, we'll find that along the way. Uh, but certainly, we think we have a very uh, well-designed and uh, thoughtful design to addressing the problem. Which brings me to my last slide, which basically says, <clears throat> as again, I want to reinforce, PCBs are harmful. Um, we want to keep our schools and our communities healthy, and that's a priority. Um, and uh, avoid any of those cancer or non-cancer related risks that we talked about. Um, there are schools that have already been tested. If we did create a pause, as I know is under discussion in the legislature, um, that would be a, an equitable thing uh, because the schools that have been tested are already embarked on their path of trying to remediate and improve the situation. Um, and we've identified problems in enough schools that um, why would we um, not allow the others to benefit in the same way. Um, I think I've shown you that this is a program that is protective for students and has been thoughtful. Um, and I would hate to see us spend time and resources on re-evaluating the program and redesigning it once again. But the most important point, of course, is bolded which is if you pause testing, people will still be exposed to harmful chemicals and be at risk for the serious health effects that we've discussed. Uh, to further illustrate this, I can tell you that um, we just got, we just informed a school this week uh, of their results. And they had uh, a, a decent number of rooms that went over the school action level but three particular rooms that went over the immediate action level. Uh, so we are, today is Wednesday, we are meeting with them tomorrow. They've already gotten letters uh, about that grid that I showed you, ways to uh, utilize the rooms they have so that all their students can still learn in that school without vacating the school by any means. Uh, but it's happening real time right now that we're protecting students and the staff that work there. So this is not some hypothetical. Um, it's happening as we speak. So I will stop there. I think everybody has a question, so let's go around the room. Senator Gulick, you want to start? I, mean, I have a series of questions. So if you can only have one. <laughs> Senator Gulick, you only have, uh, have one at a time. Yeah. Kind of a comment <laughs> for your question for you, Chair. Can we find out from the House why, well, what their justification is for this? Because, I mean, my, I mean, I'll just say I, I don't want to pause PCB testing, um, and, but I'd, I'd like to understand you know what background they have. I feel like maybe you might know. So sure, we can have we can have them in. I just I, I, I so this is coming from the house. The pause. I yeah. had a meeting. I I was recently meeting with the pro tem's office, who is not interested in pausing in terms of Senate leadership. I just want that. Sure. For the record, at this point, it doesn't mean that it won't happen, but Senate leadership isn't interested in having a pause. So you know, what we would benefit out of a six-month period is a, is a logical question, um, and people would continue to be exposed. Um, thank you, Dr. Levine, and we can go around and, and take additional questions. Uh, this has been very helpful. Who would like to go next? Everybody has questions, so Senator Yeah, you sure? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, would you mind if I spoke to Senator Hashim's question first? No, of course not. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe the genesis of this um, this thought, this this idea in in um, House uh, Education, is that given that we are looking at a more comprehensive school construction program. Um, it is worrisome that we might be putting funds, a lot of money, uh, taxpayer money, into remediating PCBs, mitigating PCBs, potentially renovating uh, a room or a part of the building, only to then find when we do this broader project that perhaps a whole wing of a school needs to be renovated or a school needs to be completely demolished and rebuilt. and so that could be um, wasteful. So isn't just a response to that, I mean, isn't part of the school construction study to take into consideration how 
to also look at PCB remediation at the same time because we don't want to keep them separate because of what you're describing. But I mean, they but they are they would they are separate. And my response is that this this testing protocol informs the schools that want to do renovation. And in fact, one thing I didn't mention is we prioritized certain schools to be tested first. A lot of it had to do with if they had renovation in the recent past or if they were planning it for the near future, if they would had um, construction in certain years, if they had a whole host of different criteria. But the bottom line was, um, renovation was on the list. So I look at it in reverse. That this process informs renovation as opposed to why not wait to see what the schools are doing and then do the testing. So, um, Thank you. Yeah. And I just don't to, want to get too much in the house position. We'll let yeah. them come in. So I would say I just represent your. I know it's, it's the same question. Okay. It's, it's, oh, okay. Isn't part of this so based on the, the lag and the testing rollout that we won't have enough information to inform the construction study. Well, if they want to have admit information in two months, yes. Um, right. So that's I think that's part of the point that yeah the la the current program is lagging, and yes. the expanded program I mean it, it puts it out you know it puts it years out into the future, and that's a problem. And, and there may be schools we weren't aware of that have renovation plans in the nearer future, but. We did use that as a criteria, so we think they told us what they told us. Yeah. So I, I'll just stick with this theme for now, but then I have other themes. Um, so <laughs> my so, and it's nice to see you again, Dr. Levine. Yeah. You spoke to us in Health and Welfare a while back. Um, so to Senator Weeks's point, if we have a school that urgently needs some work because it's got a sewer system that is not working. Um, a roof that is not um, insulated. These are examples that we were given at one point, um, and needs some fairly substantial upgrades. Um, but again, this program we're looking years out. This isn't like instantaneous. So what happens to a school that has high levels of PCBs in a gym, let's say, or an auditorium? Do their students for the next five, six? seven years and they can't use the gym, they don't get the exercise that they need on a regular basis, they don't have theater and music and band because they can't access those spaces, they don't have the money to remediate, so what, 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 and yeah, maybe so you part of that gets into the okay. next part of the okay. conversation with DEC because okay. it's really what mitigation can be put into place based on what the findings are. What the consultants then come in and say, um, is adequate versus no, you need to do this in addition. Um, and that's a bit of unknown, okay. so it's challenging. Okay. Some, you're right, if the school has a multifunction room and they can't find a substitute room for all of those activities, that's a big challenge. Yeah. Our hope is that isn't true most of the time and that there are other ways to get around that. I have to also mention, though it's not plausible in every community, that part of the strategy is also to look within the community so that if there's something that could be done in another building that's not the actual school building, um, the community know that that's available to them and, and safe for that use. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, just to follow up, we, I think we mentioned in here, we touch upon the various crises that our school system, our public school system, and probably some of our independent schools as well are facing around a variety of issues, funding, uh, staffing, mental health, vaping, one that is yes. uh, near and dear to my heart at this moment, but all of these um, are, are huge issues. Um, I, I, I am so, I am concerned when we have this discussion that, you know, dealing with this problem is going to require staffing, it's going to require money, it's going to require tax payer participation and jumping on board. And so these are all things, you know, when you, when you mentioned that um, that we have a clear set of guidelines, okay, fair enough, but in terms of like the program itself, um, how robust is it and how helpful is it going to be to our communities? Because as of right now, the testimony that I've heard from Cabot School, what I've lived in Burlington, which I know is pre-program, but Cabot School, et cetera, is that this program, it, it's not robust and um, folks are really struggling 
So I can we can leave that on the table for now. I did have some other questions I was hoping to ask. Yeah, no, I would just say that um, I think everything boils not everything, problems often boil down to communication. And communication may have been an issue at the time of Cabot uh, in a bi-directional way. Um, and an orderly progression of things didn't occur there, uh, which caused, I think, significant anxiety, uh, which was problematic. Not to minimize Cabot's problems, but that's what I'm looking for, is there, you know, the results in Cabot um, were actually things that can be done. Um, here it is. Um, they did not have any immediate action level findings. They were all uh, SAL, school action level findings. Um, and they were in classrooms, so that's obviously a concern, uh, making sure you can still put students into classrooms that are safe. Um, and the last I knew, they are still working on the mitigation kind of strategies. Uh, but I look at that as maybe something earlier in the whole process that we just needed to get the order of communications set better and uh, the way the public gets informed uh, set better. So that's great. So you feel as though it's improving. I think that was a learning That's experience. great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, around PCBs, and this might be um, something that will be answered um, after your testimony. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been told that PCBs are ubiquitous. We all have them in our bodies. Um, uh, we in health and, health and welfare have been taking a lot of testimony on various chemicals that are put in our bodies, um, female products for one, on our faces, makeup, clothing, um, on our lawns. You mentioned food. Yeah. Um, they're everywhere. The, 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 the health care um, issues that you bring up in here are so incredibly triggering. Cancer, um, endocrine, reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, you know, we immediately sort of jump into this like fight or flight panic well, mode, for sure. What I didn't see in this packet was a slide that shows the amount of time one has to spend in the exposure, and again, maybe that's coming, in an exposed space um, to, to get to have the effects, what, what science yeah. tell us, yeah. uh, so. tells, tells us about this. My other question is in terms of air quality, um, the testing is going in and it's getting a test moment in time. Tell me about air quality fluctuation in the course of an hour, a day, a week, when kids are coming in and out of the classroom. Windows might be going open and closed. Doors are opening and shutting. We might have a ventilation system that's working. Those are my two questions for now. So. Good. So. Cancer effects generally have a fair delay. We call that a latency period that goes on perhaps for decades. But the substance is within you, but the cancer is not. Uh, but it can develop over time. The non-cancer effects, we specifically use a one-year period, time interval, for calculating what's called a reasonable uh, exposure. And that's different than what the EPA did, which was used more of an average exposure level. Uh, we usually factor in uh, the age, the amount of time spent in a setting, time per day, time over a month, time over a year. So these non-cancer effects uh, are really a one-year kind of issue, uh, much more so than it could take forever to develop this. The air quality business um, it's well known that at least at the levels closer to detection, so the lower levels, um, things are being absorbed and emitted all the time um, in terms of the source of the PCBs within a room. So those may fluctuate, um, which is why we have to give a fair amount of cushion to that detection level at the bottom. But the, as you get into these higher levels, um, while they probably will fluctuate and change, they're starting out as higher levels. And so I think that unless a new ventilation system occurred the day after the testing was done, and it would perhaps radically alter the results, um, it's probably not going to be a difference in saying this is 
a bad level, even though the magnitude of that may have changed. Okay, thank you. And um, I don't know if it's I just want to make sure we get to Senator Williams. We can always come back. Do you want to follow up directly on this? I would. Okay, okay. please. You know, please go ahead. Okay. Yep, and then we'll um, go to Senator Williams. If you could send us the exposure times that are yeah, yeah. scientifically based around cancer and all of the other issues that you brought up, yeah. that would be great. But my understanding, for example, is um, at least for the cancer, it's something like, I think I'm in the ballpark, um, you know, seven hours a day, six days a week, 235 days a year for 30 years gives you a six in one million yeah, yeah. possibility. Um, and some of our, a lot of our spaces that I, at least that I've been seeing that have high levels of PCBs are spaces like gyms, auditoriums. Uh, I know that the, um, there's a kitchen at the Charlotte Elementary School that's yes. closed right now. Um, but the kids aren't in the kitchen, and even the folks who work in there are not in there for very long. So mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I just really think we need to start talking more about the exposure. Yeah, no, you make a very fair point. I think it's really, really important. Um, because all, my ultimate question is, and I know you, this and is- Keep in mind the exposure six. time keep related to the age of the kid, too. Yes. So the preschool kid, is going to be very different than the absolutely, 12th grade. Absolutely. And my last question, which is kind of a big one, um, but it, and it's hard to quantify, and I understand this, but I, I do have to ask it, having lived it. And to Senator Campion's point, I know that the chances of us closing down a school at this point is probably very slim. But I did, I did live it. Um, it caused many deleterious effects in my community. And I'm wondering if you can at all speak to you know, the, the potential deleterious effects that closing schools, closing parts of schools, requiring more taxpayer funding, staffing um, in a school district that's already strapped, what kind of effects can this have on our children? Um, because in an extreme case, given our current mental health crisis, you know, we, we could be talking about suicide, we could be dropping, talking about dropping out of school. We, in Burlington, it was kids not getting food that they get at school. Exactly. It, so, big picture, this is a complicated system, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. There are obviously, in the category of unanticipated consequences, fallout from anything. Uh, the fact that I think it's very, very, very unlikely a school would close uh, really helps that a lot because then you're dealing with uh, shuffling rooms or at worst finding another like location in the community for certain ac school activities that would be disruptive but wouldn't be as disruptive as stay home, stay safe or anything like that. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, most of this, what, what year was the act passed? It was, uh, it was about two years ago. Oh, you mean uh, for PCB testing? For PCBs. Uh, yeah. 20, 21? Yeah. 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 OK. So I mean, we were still reeling with things, but we hadn't had the whole fallout from what was going on with COVID. And we've seen what that's done. Uh, so we have to be considerate of those things for sure. I don't think that's a deal breaker in this case because I do think the whole thesis of this protocol I presented is meeting schools and communities where they are and trying to be as accommodating as possible as opposed to as restrictive as possible. It's really erring on the side of being accommodating as long as we don't get into the duration of exposure that would be hard. Senator Williams. And that kind of follow, goes right in with what uh, Senator Lewick said. You've got a, you, you've established a, a point in time. We, you have a protocol, and we're looking at what we know right now. That school was built in 1970, let's say. Um, and do we have any way that we can gauge uh, when construction was done for a particular? If they find it in the gym, uh, you know, and when was the last? Uh, construction done in the gym that could have caused that. Probably don't have those records. I would think we, well, I think the schools do, and okay. the consultants that are involved in okay. the prioritization of schools are aware of that. Because I, I was the town health officer in, in my yeah. 
in my town. And I got a call from a, a Veeper that wanted to know why there are so many cancer uh, cases. And you might be able to use some of this data, if, like particularly if it was all the, you know, the basketball team. Right. They all had got cancer and they were all you know, playing in that same gymnasium. It might be good data to try and just break it down a little bit and, and keep it yeah. separate. Yeah. And that's all I want. Yeah. Good point. Uh, any other questions before we sort of shift to our commissioner? Anything for our commissioner of health? Anything else for Dr. Levine? Thank you. Let's talk to Levine. Sir, are you remaining? Yeah, I'm going to hang out. So yeah. I do have a question, please. but I'd like to hear the next yeah, testimony. Please. Okay, great. Commissioner. Stop sharing my screen. Tough act to follow, so I'll do my best. Um, you know, I, I really do think that Dr. Lumiere's last slide to me really says it all. The positive testing does not stop exposure to harmful chemicals that have no serious health effects. That, that kind of is our position. We share that uh, view with them. One thing I would also tell you, another reason not to pause, it's working. It's working. You know, there were definitely some hiccups early on. It's the first time anyone has ever done this, okay? As far as I know, well, definitely in the country, and I'm not sure elsewhere where we're at, but this is the first time we, anyone had ever tried this. So we definitely had some fits and starts to navigate. We're doing really well now. We're really, we're on target to meet the July 2025 deadline to test all the schools, over 320 schools. So I feel like we're doing a good job. <clears throat> the results, you know, I don't want to say alarming, but they're, they're informative. You know, we're, we're finding PCBs uh, in, a, in a number of schools. Uh, we've done, we've been doing testing since June 2022. Uh, we've got test results available, and that, that that means a lot. It means you haven't just collected it, you've gone through the whole process of getting the lab to validate, et cetera. So out of 31 samples, 10 have exceeded the school action plan. That, that's not insignificant. As Dr. Levine just mentioned, we just had one last week. So we're, we're continuing to test, we're continuing to find. Um, so from what we said, we're doing what we were told to do, and, and I think we're doing a good job of it. We're working very hard in the schools to try to keep them open. That, that was always part of the mission here. I mean, I want to recognize we're coming out of COVID, you know, the, the, the reflexive thing you can say, it's in a school, shut it down, right? That doesn't, you know, I don't think even pre-COVID that wouldn't have gone over great. Now that we know the impacts of school closings, we don't want to do that. It's going to take something very extreme, which we haven't even come close to seeing to, to get us there. We can do this and we can keep kids safe we can get, and not just kids, let's remember, there's lots of people working in schools for a long, long time, so we have to worry about them. Granted, the levels are higher for adults, but they also work there a lot longer. They're there a lot longer. So, you know, we need to be protective of both the, school, the students and the staff. So we, we do feel like we're, we're making the progress that we've been asked to make. And one thing I'll mention, you mentioned the school in Charlotte where the kitchen had to close. Well, they installed a carbon filtration system and they were able to get the levels down to non-detect. So, so they're able to reopen that kitchen. So that, that's an example. So Dr. Levine mentioned mitigation versus remediation. There's a lot of things you can do to mitigate this problem. You don't have to get the source out right away. Eventually, you always want to get the source out. You can prevent these exposures and, and allow for time frames that make sense for schools to work within that time frame. We're not sitting there saying, you got to do this next week, so get all the kids out of here. So there, there's time. You know, you can move them to different places. You can use, you know, uh, either filtration systems. There's certain types of paint that are effective. So there's a lot of methodologies that can be used to keep the people in the building safe until we get to the point where we get it out of there. That's always our goal. I mean, our goal is to get these things out of the environment. But in the interim, we recognize this is a sensitive population and a sensitive issue. And we're, you know, we planned it, we built this thing with, with the health department and with the education to come up with a way that we could try to balance all these challenges. And there's always people who are gonna be unhappy and frustrated, and I understand that. No one likes to hear that there's poison in their school. You know, that's not good news. 
So, you know, we try to work with them and help them understand, you know, what it means, what the risks are. So we get, you know, health helps us understand the effects. We manage the risk. That's our job. And so we eventually, our job is eventually to eliminate the risk. But in the interim, we're very willing and able to, uh, to work with schools to make these things work. Questions for the commissioner? Yes. So just out of curiosity, uh, maybe to, have to address uh, Senator Bullock's question. Uh, so I just completed a, a radon test in my home, yeah. which I think came was one, from one of your departments. But there was a okay, that was a year-long test, and to, to to your point, it just sat there and you know come and go and what have you. But uh, for the for the uh, PCB test, is it a one-hour test, like a sniffer, or is it a long-term test? Just to kind of give us a sense of yeah. the rollout and how long this rollout takes for so, testing. You know, I'm just the commissioner. I, I don't do the testing, but I have my expert who actually knows all these things on Teams chat right now. So I'm yeah. hoping to see the little typing symbol, but I will be able to tell you that. Okay. Thank you. Can I also say to you that there was, I think WCAX did a, um, a, a little expose on the testing. They actually showed some of the folks who do the testing in the rooms with their machine that they use. and. I mean, I can try to find that and send it to you, but that was really actually okay. kind of interesting to see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and I'm talking about, I remember because I used to help the janitor. Yeah. That's kind of my uh, mm. detention help. Oh, and, when you were a kid. Oh, yeah, when yeah. I was a kid. <laughs> and they used, to, uh, they used to put down a compound on the, on the floors. They would go and spread it around, and then they used a big dust mop that, that kind of cleaned the floor. That, that might be something that had PCBs in it. Uh, I just, just got my answer. And it smelled good. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. used it. Yeah. It's all poison in it. Yeah. It's 24 hour testing. 24 hours. Yeah. They use a pump attached to a PUF filter. Don't ask me what a PUF filter is. But the sample is collected for 24 hours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Levine, to both of you for, um, for your work. And we all want to keep our kids and our staff safe. That is so incredibly important. Um, but again, you know, I, I can't, I can't say enough um, how much our schools are already struggling, and I, I, I just hate to make things harder for them. We have fewer teachers going into the profession than ever before, and I feel like every time we make their job harder, um, it is, is, it is harmful. It is harmful. So I'm just gonna leave that. Um, I want to get back to the action levels um, and the immediate action levels. And I am so happy to hear about Charlotte, by the way. Thank you for, for letting me know. That's fantastic. Yeah, just that. yeah that's great. Um, so I, I, I assume when you make come up with these levels, 300, 30 to 100, excuse me, for action level, and then 90 for 300 for the immediate action levels, you are taking into account the space and how much it's being used or accessed. Is that correct? That's really more for okay. So so okay, so immediate action level, uh, if a school has a ninety-five in their gym, for example, and the gym is only used by kids maybe three times a week for an hour, um, for 180 days a year, is that uh, is that part of the equation? Is that, that you, when you came up with this 90? Right, so it's not part of the equation, but it's part of the grid of what you do about it. Okay. Which option do you pick? Okay. So I could see that school taking the option that gives them a whole year and lets the gym be occupied as it normally is, as long as the students are at the right age, because I would think a preschool student would not be. Okay. Not that um, they would be anyways, but you know, we're sure it was for the right age population. Great. But it, it didn't determine how the level, you know, it's not in reverse. Okay, great. Thank Almost you. came yeah. first. Yeah. yeah. That actually brings to mind a real life example. We had a school where a, um, it was an elementary school classroom, uh, read levels where they couldn't be in the classroom, but they were low enough that older kids could be. And so we basically just had them switch classrooms. So we were still able to keep the kids safe, keep them in school, albeit in little different rooms, but hopefully definitely not as disruptive as it's having them, you know, have to go someplace completely different than a classroom. Right. So. Yeah, okay, thank you. And um, so 
I, were, do you advise, did you advise Charlotte, for example, on that air filtration system? Who was the entity that did that? It, most likely it was our consultant, but we, we, I'm sure we were involved. I'm sure they, we would have worked with the consulting firm to, to help them with that. We worked very closely. Great. My staff works very closely with the school's consultants, and, and they kind of problem solve and figure these things out. Wonderful, because it does seem as though with the air levels, um, there can be, mitigation can be probably fairly simple and also very on target and it really it depends but there okay. are that's a good example that one that's it that's yeah. relatively easy to be up like that but some spaces are bigger you know it's harder to identify it also sounds like i forgot to mention i think they might have found a source there they found a capacitor um, in, in that room and they took it out and so they're going to go back and do some sampling to see if you even need the filtration but you know everyone is a little different every scenario is a little bit different but yeah, there are potential scenarios where the mitigation is, is pretty straightforward and we can keep everybody safe and not have to do anything too disruptive. Great. Um, can I ask either of you two to comment on the amount that is currently set aside for funding? Is it adequate? And second question is, what? how do you, <laughs> I'm not sure you can answer this, but how do you feel about the 80-20 split? On the funding. Um, all, all I can really tell you is I don't, I, I'm not aware of anyone seeking additional funds at this time. I, I will tell you I would be very surprised if that $30 million ends up being sufficient based upon what we've seen today. But I'm not aware of any specific asks at this point in time. In terms of the 80-20 split, you know, it's, it's really based upon um, uh, our approach to brownfields, you're familiar with brownfields, so when, when we have brownfields projects, that's the typical split between kind of, the, not the schools are private, but for, for non-state entities, pay 20% and the state pays 80. So that's, that was really where it originated, and so that's where we're at with that. Yes, please. So, certainly uh, drawbacks to and benefits to being the first in the nation to pursue any kind of program, certainly a program that's you know, affecting students and the staff in the schools. But um, given the cost of potential remediation of, of, of the problem, um, I'm just still trying, I'm still struggling with um, to justify to constituents the, the difference between Vermont's levels of acceptable exposures and the EPA's levels. How can we bring the two together so I mean, what, what we do here is essentially can be mirrored by other states, uh, but not to drain the treasury of the, of the state at a time when it's difficult to afford. So I mean, I'll let Dr. Levine talk to the more technical aspects. I can tell you from a regulatory perspective. So I, I did work in EPA for a number of years, and so I have a sense of how their, their system works. It's much slower than ours. you are probably not surprised. I'll just give an example. Dr. Levine mentioned in 2016 when we found PFAS in Bennington, EPA was at 400 PPT. Right? We, we did a lot of work. We got to 20. We had an emergency rule passed. We cleaned it up. Just this month, EPA announced that there, there's MCLs for the two primary PFAS compounds that we find in our state, PFOA and PFOS, is four parts per trillion. So just to give you a sense of the dynamic, right? In 70 years, you know, 100 fold more now. So, you know, I think they're a little bit behind us, is my sense. You know, we, we were, we're just on top of this. This has been known since 20, I believe, 2013 is the first publication I could find from EPA indicating that PCBs, indoor, indoor air emissions from PCBs were dangerous. The state set its first levels in 2014. So I just feel like Vermont, and if you look at Dr. Levine has a slide indicating various lawsuits, there's a lot going on out there, you know, and, and I, I don't, I feel like, it's, it's a good reflection on us. We're getting out ahead of it. There's people getting sick. And so I, I'm comfortable with, with these folks setting levels that, that I believe are protected from human health. Well, like Dr. Levine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you did a wonderful job of answering that question. <laughs> now, if you just look at the PFAS compounds, you look at the lead in the drinking water, uh, I mean, it's good to be ahead of the game uh, when you're science-based. Again, we're not cowboys just willy-nilly doing things. These are very science-based decisions. These are uh, well accepted in the toxicology community, but it takes uh, a 
lot of effort to move policy at the national level and regulatory structures at the national level. And I think we're a little more facile in being able to do that. But again, I, you know, I, I hate to give the answer to you to tell your constituents just have faith. Uh, but look at experience, and look at the track record, and look at the fact that we actually can justify every decision we've made in terms of why we included the number of hours, the number of days, the number of years. Um, all of those factors going into the formulas that are used to decide where a level should be. And again, what level of risk is a constituent willing to assume? You know, most people would look at one in a million or six in a million and go, well, I don't want to be that one or that six, but that doesn't sound so bad. Uh, but that's really where the field of toxicology is in looking at things. And we don't want to make a departure from that and say, we'll go an order of magnitude difference. So 60 people per million is acceptable in Vermont. That would not be acceptable. Uh, so we have to really be data and science driven. Are there any levers that our federal delegation can pull to get the EPA to, you know, to have them have a conversation? I mean, it just seems like there's it's a very expensive disconnect. Yeah. Every state is watching closely what happens here and want us to share our findings with them. Uh, so just the findings alone, never mind uh, what's done with the findings, just the findings alone, I think, are going to have an impact. So your question may be a little premature. We need to let our data accumulate and then show it to the world and get them to uh, see what they think. And they can critically appraise it, just like anything else that's scientifically published. Okay. Maybe just give you a little more re like regulatory context as opposed to the more science-based context. If you call the EPA, so EPA that is something called a removals program, which, which deals with kind of imminent hazards, like bad stuff, right? You call them in. If they went to a school in Vermont and found levels at five, five, they would consider that an imminent hazard and they would take immediate action. So just to give you a sense, you know, it, it, they're not saying that we're too high, it's just they have a different construct than we do. I think ours is probably more thought out than theirs is. Okay. Thank you, Bob. And this committee, frankly, I mean, we have the chief health officer, the environmental officer, and the governor saying, don't pause. So this committee has to decide whether or not it wants to fight that, get a possible veto. I, I mean, I have to sort of sent, get a really, and say six months, again, to me, I, at least from what I've heard, six months isn't it's just going to pick back up again. So uh, what I would hate to see happen, but just as the chair, is testimony, 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 and we all end up still having a majority of the committee saying, hey, we're, we're not going to pause. So I just want us to keep in, that in mind, given that April 1st is soon, and we have got a lot of work to do. Senator Fuller. Mm -hmm. I would just like to end with, I'm not necessarily in favor of pausing. I would like to hear more from uh, the folks uh, in the know how, how this program is going to play with our school construction bill because that's a really, really critical conversation. Um, and so, I, any advice you have, uh, I thoughts? I not just, and if I may, just on, I think one of the things Senator Gulick is rightfully focused on also is the funding piece. I mean, how is there something that we 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 did write to our federal delegation? We're kind of hammering it home as much as we can with them. We know. Vermont starting this, but everybody's going to, going to do it. How can we? How can we do it? And then I also center and change your hand. Yep. Yeah, just please. wanted to close by saying, I mean, I, in my personal life, I defer to my doctor when he gives me medical <laughs> advice when it comes to psychology. <laughs> really? I want to most of the time. I, I want to defer to uh, the commissioner here. Uh, but then there's also the piece of, you know, trying just trying to put myself. Well, I, I am a dad of a 12 year old, but you know, thinking about the other parents who are sending their kids to school and then seeing that this testing is going to be potentially paused, that makes me uncomfortable, and I imagine it would also make other parents uncomfortable. And then there's also the piece that was mentioned earlier: the that this PCD testing can inform the school construction process and. My, my opinion is that these aren't two separate things. Uh, and 
lastly, oh, the uh, the eighty twenty situation, the, the funding for this. That I mean, when I talked to my uh, to the superintendent in Linden County, uh, you know, that that was one of his concerns as well, and it's and I think that's going to be the challenge, um, at least in my opinion, the funding part is going to be the challenge for this. So I, you I, yeah, I just I do have a slide that I'll I'll just send it to the committee assistant, but it's just to talk you through it. I mean, one of the key factors here is when I was talking about mitigation. If we can prevent these exposures, there's there there's a fair amount of flexibility within within that time frame. As long as the kids and the staff aren't being exposed, the actual remediation, which is where the construction piece comes in, right? You can you can do mitigation measures like air filters or just paint and stuff. That's not going to disrupt the construction schedule. There, could, there are ways to try to make things more aligned. You may not be perfect, right? If they're talking 10 years from now, but I would never be comfortable waiting 10 years to, to fix the problem. But if it's within reason, you know, if you take, you know, there's something called a corrective action plan that can kind of set things up. As long as we've got the exposures under control, there should be ways to, to mitigate some of that in, in effort. And I get that. A school doesn't want to go out and renovate a wing because of PCBs and come back a year later and do the same thing. So there, there, are, there is some, flexibility within reason built in here as long as we make sure that the people in the building are safe. Okay, but I'll shoot that over to the staff. Okay. Any other questions or comments for either of our witnesses? It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you both thank for you. everything you're doing. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, any, any other final, uh, run a little over? Uh, Looks like tomorrow the floor is going to also run another couple hours, so. Couple, yeah. Yeah. yeah, one, to, one three. to three. Yeah. So we'll be in here from three to about four thirty. Yeah, and I know we've got a bill. Anybody else? Have got a third meeting. Okay. I can do that. Thank you both. Yeah. Really yeah. appreciate it. Five minutes. To come in. I've got yeah. five pages. Yeah, I bet you do. Tough questions <laughs> for you. So. Okay, I think we will close it and end the day. Thanks, everybody. He's taking notes. Thanks, everybody. So is it? Thank you.